Welcome to the podcast, Con. Thank you, Peter. Okay, great to have you on here. And I'm excited about our, our discussion today because I know I'm going to learn a lot. But before we dive in, let's, um, why don't you give the listeners a little bit of background about yourself? You've had a long and storied career and um, tell us some of the highlights. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me on. Uh, first of all, if I can claim the privilege of, of uh, calling you an old friend. Yes, I think, uh, I think that's fair. We've been working together for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I consider it a privilege to be on this program. And and uh, you go back to the uh, Lendit days, and I go back to the OP days, and right. now you're FinTech Nexus, and I'm uh, American FinTech Council. So time marches on. But um, if I could, before I mention anything about myself, I'd, I'd kind of like to set the table in terms of why the listeners should be interested in this topic, if that's all right. Yep, sure. Um, well, I think there are, I think there are, Three significant reasons. Uh, everybody in our society wears several hats. And first of all, um, everyone is a ta taxpayer in some form or another. So in that capacity, they are subsidizing, they are paying for this $1.5 trillion enterprise that is severely underperforming. And don't just take my word for it. That's factual. Secondly, um, as consumers, and as depositors of banks, we've all remarked at how low the interest rates that banks pay on our savings and demand accounts are, NCDs. Well, the home loan banks are one of the reasons, one of the significant re reasons why traditional banks can get away with paying very, very low rates. So we have skin in the game, both as taxpayers and as consumers slash depositors, but more significantly, um, on the line, I'm sure are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the FinTech space. And uh, I'm happy to say that this review process that has been going on for quite some time now, now uh, culminated in a report by the FHFA in November, um, I think holds significant opportunities for entrepreneurs in, in the fintech space. And we can get into those in a little more, more sure. detail later. But it's it's safe to say that the, the, the 11 federal home loan banks have really botched it when it comes to dealing with the fintech industry. And let me, let's just go through a few, a few instances that your listeners may or may not be aware of. Silvergate Bank in California, Mm -hmm. uh, went from being a traditional thrift lending to the housing industry and a member of the Home Loan Bank of San Francisco into being the bank for crypto. Yep. And it was only revealed in January of this year that it was being kept alive by a $4.3 billion line of credit advances from the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. That's not a good thing. And then eventually it went into self-liquidation. Then you came to Signature Bank uh, in New York, which itself uh, was a, a crypto bank. Um, and, and it had to uh, be put into receivership by the FDAC. And then bringing it just to last month, um, the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York promoted to being its chairman an individual who played a prominent role in the FTX empire. And by prominent, I mean he directed customers of FTX to go to Signature Bank. And then, and all the while he was sitting as chair of the risk committee, and, and then the Home Loan Bank of New York loaned up to $10 billion to Signature Bank. So if that is not a conflict of interest, I'm not clear on what is, right. but it cer certainly doesn't seem to be the kind of behavior that deems being rewarded uh, uh, be with the chairmanship of one of the largest federal home loan banks, which is what happened. Um, 
So as, as for me, my, my life history is fairly simple. I was a federal home loan bank director, independent director in Boston for 14 years. Um, for eight years, I served at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, DC. I was an official there. Um, my, my main area of concentration was uh, uh, foreign banks in the US and US banks abroad. Uh, I was general counsel for a large regional bank holding company for about uh, eight years. And then for the last 18 years or so, I have to pinch myself every time I say that, but I've been an academic at Boston mm -hmm. University teaching in the law school. But for this purpose, uh, for the purposes of this conversation, the two roles that I am most proud of is um, I co-founded uh, something called the Coalition for Federal Home Loan Bank Reform. And uh, this is an eclectic organization of former regulators, bankers, housing advocates, civil rights leaders. Um, one prominent member, you, many of you, your uh, listeners might recall, is Cam Fine, mm -hmm. who is the former uh, president of the Independent Community Bankers of America. A very eclectic group focused on turning this massive government sponsors enterprise around so that it serves a legitimate public purpose uh, once again. So that's uh, that's the uh, coalition or CFR as we call it. The, the other hat that I wear, and I, I hope that your listeners take me up on this, is as uh, chairman of the Community Advisory Board of the American FinTech Council. Um, I didn't mention that as part of the coalition, we have a lot of FinTechs because we don't have a lot of FinTechs. I, I don't think the fintech industry largely has woken up to the fact that there are significant opportunities in this reform effort. So, uh, Phil Goldfeder, if you're listening, uh, the door <laughs> I'm the sure door he's is, listening. <laughs> the door is open uh, to joining our coalition, and I and, and I think we can accomplish a lot of a lot of uh, good things in in that regard. Okay, well let's let's um let's back it up for a second, sure. and I want to talk about what a federal home loan bank is exactly, why they exist. I think, I think it came out of the Great Depression, but tell us a little bit about the origins here. Sure. Uh, you're right. They, they do come out of the Great Depression, but not out of the New Deal. Uh, uh, before there was FDR, there was Herbert Hoover, um, and it was his administration that came up with this uh, proposal. It was a um, legislation that was designed to stimulate the housing industry uh, at the time. And it was modeled after the uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank Act of uh, 2013, of 1913, excuse me. And um, it, um, it allowed savings and loans and insurance companies, which at that time were the major lenders into the mortgage market, to be members of uh, any one of the 12 um, home loan banks that were to be set up uh, if they were in their district. Um, and so that's the way it operated for decades, really. Um, and, and the most significant change came in um, 1989, uh, following the savings and loan crisis when a couple of things happened. First of all, membership was opened up to commercial banks and credit unions, no longer just savings and loans and insurance companies, but now the, the entire banking industry. That was a significant change, particularly when you look at membership today and you realize that most of the members are commercial banks and they dominate the system and savings and loans have largely gone away. As, as a significant part of the uh, financial services landscape. The other thing that uh, the 1989 legislation did was it, um, it required each of the home loan banks to devote 10% of their net income to affordable housing. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, so, and that was the uh, perceived uh, public mission that, that the home loan banks were supposed to play. Finally, what happened then was, uh, I mentioned this legislation came on the heels of the savings and loan crisis. There was an organization set up to uh, to bail out the savings and loan industry. It was called REF Corp. And each 
home loan bank was required to devote 20% of its net income to retire the debt of Ref Corp, which had been set up to bail out the savings and loan industry. So that, that oh, the other thing that I, I should mention in this uh, brief history here is something happened in the 1980s and continues to this day, which is highly significant to the purpose of the home loan bank system, and it's called simply securitization, mm. where where the uh, liquidity um, in the mortgage market uh, was taken over not uh, uh, by the home loan banks, but by the massive securitization um, under either the auspices of um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or the private label industry. Right. Okay. So let's, um, what I'd like to do before we go any further though, is talk about the, the, the regulatory structure here because the, the FHFA, the federal housing finance agency regulates these federal home loan banks. Uh, that's how I understand it. Um, they also regulate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, can you sort of describe what their role is in and how how they regulate these eleven um, member banks? Yeah, so FHFA was set up in two thousand and eight uh, by a special law that was passed just before the um, uh, financial crisis hit with full force, and that law was passed uh, with um, the Bush administration's recommendation recognizing that there might might come a day when uh, Fannie and Freddie would have to be put into conservatorship. And um, right. it was uh, fairly non-controversial at the time. I think uh, I think uh, Secretary Paulson referred to it as the bazooka in the closet that would never have to be used. Right. Well, <laughs> he was he was proven long wrong uh, pretty quickly wrong. Pretty yes. quickly, pretty quickly. <laughs> so this is the uh, the, the bazooka uh, administration. It's had many other names in the past, um, but it is headed by one person, a director, her name is Sandra Thompson. She was appointed by the president. Uh, um, and uh, she, like uh, Rohit Chopra at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, serve at the pleasure of the president, uh, meaning uh, by, by virtue of a Supreme Court case that came to, down in the last uh, year or so. Meaning that um, whatever is on her agenda is ne not necessarily on the agenda of the next president, whoever that may be, whenever that may be. Um, and that the next president, if, if it's of a different party than uh, Biden, uh, could um, terminate her on day one, and probably would, which is virtually what the Biden administration did when, when they came in. So they regulate uh, they regulate the home loan banks uh, much like they much like a, a traditional bank is regulated. There, there is a, a composite uh, rating of uh, capital and assets and management, liquidity and so on. Um, but there, the, the part of the structure is that each of the home loan banks unlike traditional banks, are jointly and severally liable for each other's obligation. So in a sense, they're all in, a, in it together. So you would, you, you would think, I would think that that would lead to some self-regulation, some self-discipline on the part of the home loan banks. And yet we see certain of the home loan banks, uh, for example, I mentioned the New York and the San Francisco experience uh, going uh, somewhat rogue, <laughs> and they can uh, they can get away with that, uh, not because they uh, have a, a regulator who doesn't care, uh, but because they boast that they have never made a loan that has gone bad. Think about that for a minute. In 91 years, none of the known those banks claim that they have made a loan that has never gone bad. It's a ludicrous statement on its face, 
The only reason it has a scintilla of truth to it is that all of the loans that have gone bad, Silicon First Republic Signature, right. et cetera, um, uh, IndyMac, Washington Mutual, Countrywide, <laughs> we can go on and on, mm -hmm. uh, are eventually, uh, the losses are eaten by the uh, FDIC, which, which as we know, is, is a relatively limited fund. At the end of last year, it was only $28 billion in the deposit insurance fund. The, the true value of the FDIC guarantee is the fact that the full faith and credit of the United States taxpayer is behind it. Mm -hmm. Just as the full faith and credit of the taxpayer is perceived to be behind the 1.5 or so trillion debt offerings of the home loan banks. So, so there's a bit of a circularity here going on. Right, right. So then um, let's talk about the, the governance culture. I, I, you know, I, I've been receiving uh, your emails, and this is how this obviously came about. You know, you've been talking about this for a long time and really putting putting it out there, some of the problems with governance of these banks. So tell us a little bit about the the governance culture of the federal home loan banks, and also with when you, when you're answering, keep in mind what what's actually relevant for the fintech industry here. Uh, well, as a matter of governance, there there it is. It is a very closed society. I mean, extremely closed society. Uh, and, and I point to the fact that over this more than a year's long strategic review process that the regulator has been conducting. Few, if any, of the home loan banks or of the directors, even independent directors of the home loan banks have come forward with any ideas on their own. Uh, they, they, they speak largely through one lobbyist in Washington and one lobbyist only. And there is a groupthink mentality to their detriment, I believe, that infects the home loan banks themselves as institutions, but also each individual board of directors. Um, my, my own experience was um, uh, somewhat agonizing is in that um, uh, by virtue of my speaking out for reform, um, the home loan, the directors of the Boston Bank uh, thought that I ought to be removed as a director. They didn't do it <laughs> because it was a ludicrous proposition to begin with. But also uh, that was then, this is now, I mentioned the Home Loan Bank of New York situation. It, it, it is only hubris. It is only uh, arrogance that could cause a bank board to nominate it as its chairman uh, a former executive of FTX, uh, literally in the same year that FTX imploded with such resounding embarrassment, and yet they n nominated this individual with the uh, conflicts uh, associated with it. So, from the board level, from the um, uh, bank level, it's it's a it's an impenetrable, unfortunately. Um, organization. It doesn't have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is, It is. at the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves that it is an instrument of the government. Right. There's, yes. I mean, I mean, why, why aren't board meetings open to the public, for example? Why aren't loans that are made to members uh, disclosed uh, at the time that they're made, rather than uh, after Silicon Valley fails or First Republic fails, then everybody finds out and says, oh my God, <laughs> how did that happen? If simple disclosure were the rule of the road, market forces would, would have their own way of resolving these things. You wouldn't need the FDIC. You could have, we could have known, the marketplace could have known a year ahead that Silicon Valley was in an extreme condition just by virtue of the fact that it was borrowing $15 billion from the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. 
uh, ditto for First Republic, uh, you know, ditto for Signature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to talk about the the um, you know the the mission of the federal home loan banks, and you know, you talked about it was really as part of a housing a housing crisis of the Great Depression, um, and you know. It's it seems to not be that anymore. It's a liquidity provider um, to to large banks. It seems a you know sort of a I don't know what's the bank of last resort, but it certainly has, as you've just mentioned, made a, a number of of loans to banks that were in trouble. Um, when and how did that mission change? Because um, it doesn't feel like I mean I've I've seen some of your your uh, emails that say that that they don't even when you ask what their mission is, they don't even talk about housing and community development they talk about liquidity provide right um, and so how, how did that change yeah um i th i think it evolved over time i, I mentioned the, uh, that the commercial banks taking over as the largest group of members uh, starting in 1989 but continuing until this day i mentioned securitization uh, you know gradually the system became um really uh, more irrelevant to housing but it became very meaningful to the members who who saw it as an access to cheap funding, mm -hmm. right? So, so the, the the members took took it over. It, they were fortunate to have uh, a number of uh, very complicit regulators over the years. Um, the the same regulator as we've talked uh, of the home loan banks regulates Fannie and Freddie. And in the scheme of things, the home loan banks were very happy to fly under the radar. They were getting uh, access to subsidized funds. Um, nobody was asking them to do more than the 10%, and, but, and the 10% is ludicrously small, 10% of net income for housing, for uh, affordable housing. Um, and then you, you uh, combine all of that with, a, with an insular, culture, as we discussed a moment ago, and it's not surprising uh, that it, um, it lost its mission. The mission has always been, yes, liquidity, sure, but liquidity for a purpose. Right. right. And the purpose is housing and community development. Make no mistake about that. But as you say, the, the home loan bank lobbyists and representatives will say no. It's all about liquidity, and hopefully some of that liquidity will trickle down into communities in the form of loans. Um, but that, but that's not the way it was set up to work. Right, right. So, so I want to I want to be clear because I mean banks have a place they can go to for liquidity. It's the Federal Reserve. Why do banks go to the federal home loan banks instead of the Fed when they need liquidity? Because it's easy. <laughs> because 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 you go you go to a home loan bank and basically you put in an order, right? It's, it's not called an order, but you're you're basically uh, borrowing whatever you want, right? You go you go to the Fed discount window and you apply, and some awkward questions can be asked. And oh, by the way, if you get the loan from the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, there's a, a certain they call it taint that goes with that. Um, the, but the, in, in the case of the home loan banks, it's no questions asked. Uh, and that's why the the regulator has proposed, and I, and, and I believe will enact, uh, rules and guidance that uh, will call an end to that nonsense. That this, that this should not be an open-ended uh, line of credit to every institution regardless of its condition, a la Silicon, and regardless of its business model, a la Silvergate. It, again, again, it's liquidity for a purpose, not, not liquidity to muscle out the Federal Reserve. The country does not need two lenders of last resort. Right. I don't know of any other country that has them. And certainly we don't need two lenders of last resort uh, where one is uh, being gamed against the other. So what the uh, regulator has proposed and will and will carry out, I'm confident, is that, that there be in place 
standing agreements uh, between um, each home loan bank and each Federal Reserve Bank in that district uh, uh, so that we don't get into a Silicon Valley situation again where where the two regulators are tripping all over themselves trying to transfer collateral. Right. So then, what what's the um, what's the funding mechanism here for the federal home loan banks? I mean, I presume they have taxpayer subsidies of some kind. What can you tell us about that? So there's something within the home loan bank system called the Office of Finance. Uh, it's not the regulator. It's it really acts as uh, uh, the fiscal agent for the home loan banks, similar to the way the Fed acts as a fiscal agent for the Treasury. And um, and it issues uh, consolidated uh, obligations um, on behalf of the eleven banks, and they are perceived in the marketplace to have the implicit guarantee of the taxpayer behind them, and that is that is that is the essence, not the totality, but is it is the essence of their subsidy of their subsidy. Because they can say that the federal government stands behind them, even if only implicitly, then they borrow at virtually the same rate as the federal government does, plus a few basis points. Right. That, so that's heavily subsidized. Um, studies been, have been done of that over the years, including my own. Um, that measure the amount of that subsidy. I, I come up with a number of $6 billion. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office came up with a number of $3.2 billion. I hasten to add that the CBO study was 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it was before uh, the conservatorships of Fannie and Freddie, Freddie, where the implicit guarantee was made virtually explicit. So I'm willing to wager that when and if CBO renews its research, they will be way ahead of my estimate. Now, again, that's just, that's just the subsidized debt. Uh, they are also tax exempt at the state level, at the federal level, the banks are tax exempt and the um, interest on the debt that they issue is tax exempt. The, the value of that, again, according to CBO, is approximately $1.5 billion a year. So we're talking about serious, serious money. Right. right. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not even including in that number what I referred to earlier, which is the loss of income that you and I experience because we can't get a reasonable rate of return from our bank because the bank is borrowing instead from the home loan bank, which we subsidize. So, so there's, a, there's a, 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 a double insult going on here. Right, right. Okay, so let's talk about reform because you, you know, it was just a few weeks ago now, the, the, the report came out. I think you said it was like a year long study. Um, what what reforms have been put on the table in this report? Well, there's a lot. It's a 117-page report. I don't know. There are scores of recommendations. Um, probably the most significant ones are to uh, reconcile what you and I were just talking about a moment ago, namely the mission. Uh, the mission is not liquidity standalone. The mission is and always has been and will be forever liquidity to promote housing and community development. So that's 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 the first issue that they will lead with. Um, there are, the, the, the report also addresses this um, lack of any uh, underwriting discipline uh, in lending to institutions troubled or untroubled. Uh, the report um, also recommends that um, this 10% uh, affordable housing assessment be increased to 20%. And I might add that Sandra Thompson gave a talk last week, maybe a month ago, um, where she indicated that 
the, the, the doubling of the affordable housing assessment could, quote, easily be accomplished by the home loan banks. And she emphasized easily several times in her remarks to me that that was a loud signal that the 20%, which would have to be enacted by Congress, probably should be closer to 30 or 40%. Again, again, going back, as I said earlier, at one time, it was 10% plus a 20% assessment to retire the REF Corp debt. So Sandra Thompson is right. They could easily handle 30%. And why not? It's a public-private partnership after all. And if the banks are going to take 70% and only give 30% back to affordable housing and to communities, even that doesn't seem like a very bad deal for the banks. Right. If I were, if I were uh, the head of the American Bankers Association, I'd, I'd take it and run with it. <laughs> and it really, it's it's so ne necessary now because, I mean, it's like it's, we're not in the Great Depression, obviously, but the housing market is... Uh in dire need, dire need of more affordable housing. It's it, there's a lot of people that just simply can't afford to buy a house anymore. I mean, can we just stipulate to that? And <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, I would I would love love to hear the home loan bank push back against that proposition. Right. Um, it, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so maybe we can talk about what comes next as we close and. Uh, you know what? What reforms do you think will be implemented? What would you like to see implemented that um, maybe it ha has has less of a chance? I mean, what? Um, yeah, what's next? Well, um, as I mentioned, mission is go going to be decided, and um, and the home loan banks and the lobbyists are going to be hard pressed to resist that notion. Uh, that would be a. Uh, uh, even if they won it in court, it would be a Pyrrhic victory at best uh, because it would lead to uh, eventually bad consequences. But for your for your audience, I think what, what I'd like to suggest here uh, is something some things from the report that might not be uh, evident to every fintech entrepreneur or practitioner. So, for example, um, the uh, one of the proposals, uh, proposals is that um, in order to borrow from the home loan bank, you have to maintain 10% of your assets in in mortgage related instruments. Mm -hmm. Seems very reasonable, except when you consider that a large number of the members of home loan banks are insurance companies that have no direct mortgage exposure. They might have some agency securities, but they have no mortgage no mortgage exposure. And many of the commercial banks long ago exited the the housing mortgage market. Mm -hmm. So they don't have that on their balance sheets. So <clears throat> many of the members are going to be faced with a day of reckoning. Do we give up a home loan bank membership or we do we scramble to um dress up our balance sheet so that, that we can meet these this new criteria. And I think that's where uh, if, uh, um, the members of uh, your audience could play a very important role, uh, both in finding new customers uh, for these institutions, in qualifying them uh, for loans, in underwriting the loans, in, in servicing the loans. I, th I think there's a, a significant role to, to play there. Um, when you boil it all down, um, yes, it would be nice for a fintech to be a member of a home loan bank, which it cannot be today unless it happens to be a, an insured depository institution or an insurance company. That is not, that's in the law, but it is not an inviolable principle. And the reason I say that is that from a risk perspective, there are three levels of risk that a home loan bank faces. One level is the member bank itself borrowing. That's first line. The second is the collateral. All loans are collateralized in some way, either by mortgages or um, government securities. 
And then the third level is uh, this FDIC uh, serving as the serving as the um, last uh, backstop for any losses, right? Um, I think you could make a case credibly to the regulator that, that as long as as long as the collateral is good, and as long as as long as you are a um, safe and sound institution, you ought to be admitted to membership. Now it's a, it's a big mountain to climb. No no doubt about it because you were talking about statutory reform here. And the mortgage mortgage bankers would would love to climb that mountain mountain and and haven't been able to do so, but I think that's uh, indicative of of an other another way of uh, looking at this. The, the other is you know we we talk a lot about banking as a service, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're all familiar with the Madden rule and how that uh, and conundrum uh, worked out. Um, well, if, if you look at uh, the, the, the fintechs as being a, a gateway to a bank uh, that, uh, if it wants to be a member of the home loan bank, has to be in the mortgage business somehow, uh, the, the fintechs could play that uh, very dynamic role, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a legitimate way of, of looking at some of these uh, proposals. Don't get me wrong. The, the the regulator, Sandra Thompson, is no pushover. Uh, safety and sound, safety and soundness are uh, wor word that uh, trip out of her mouth uh, frequently by virtue of her having spent 23 years at the FDIC. But at the same time, I think she is pragmatic. And I think that she knows that this huge institution could do more in terms of public benefits. And she's willing to um, ex exercise whatever authority she does have to make sure that it has a more positive impact on our communities. Okay, Carmel, well, we're out of time. We'll have to leave it there. Uh, really appreciate you coming on today and explaining this uh, fairly you know, complicated uh, system to us. So much appreciated. Peter, I'm delighted to be with you and uh, and look forward to seeing you again at uh, yes, one of your sure. events or our events. Indeed. Okay. See you later. Okay. Yeah, be well.